Thank you very much. Great honour to be introduced by uh, such a distinguished former minister of Afghanistan. Um, if you're starting to fall asleep because of all these speeches, uh, stay awake. There's a couple of films to come as well as some speaking. So uh, I'm going to try and uh, do something different here uh, late on in the afternoon. Um, I want to talk about the Sustainable Development Goals for a number of reasons. Uh, partly, as I said this morning on the panel, I think that uh, peace and development go hand in hand. And all of these discussions that we are having about uh, building bridges, conflict resolution, peace, a greater cultural understanding in the world uh, will come to nothing if there is not development for the poorest um, and most excluded uh, people of the world. Uh, so I want to, to talk specifically about development because it is important to the wider topic that, that, that we have been addressing this weekend. But I also want to talk about the process of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and uh, if we go on, I'm not sure exactly how to do these slides, but uh, I'm hoping Esteban is just going to keep clicking along. Yes. Uh, whether or not the SDGs herald a new era of global cooperation. And the way that they have been created, devised and agreed uh, perhaps gives us a pointer for how the world can operate in a better way in future. Uh, you hope, I hope, are all aware of the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals may seem moderate by today's standards, but they were revolutionary back in 2000. Uh, it was a new thing for the United Nations to set out such ambitious targets uh, for the new century. And uh, they were indeed ambitious, and that's one of the reasons why most of them have not been met. Uh, but uh, they were also devised in a very small group of people in a very small room in New York City and not discussed around the world before they were uh, agreed. The MDGs uh, had eight targets, and I think we may have the list of the eight targets on the next slide. Yep. Uh, and uh, the story goes that when the United Nations was going to meet and agree these new uh, uh, MDGs uh, back in 2000, 2001. Uh, the person who was drafting uh, the targets were, had drafted out uh, seven targets um, and was walking along the uh, corridor to the meeting when somebody stopped him and said, did you remember to put in something about the environment and climate change? And number seven was added in the corridor on the way to the meeting uh, and then agreed. And uh, at as I say, I think at the time, now, now looking back, we perhaps underestimate just how revolutionary setting out these targets was, and we uh, don't necessarily appreciate the political will that was needed to agree them and to, and, and to move ahead. But the reality was, because there was not a process, because there wasn't global engagement, because it wasn't a genuine partnership between North and South, then it took about three, four, five years, really, to get momentum going on the MDGs, and uh, even as we reach the 31st of December 2015, which was the target for all these targets, uh, then we will find that across the world, country after country, will not have met the MDG targets that were set uh, back then. And in particular, and this is particularly relevant for this uh, conference this weekend, not one fragile or conflict-affected state in the world today will meet even one MDG target. So although there are countries, many countries, in many continents uh, that are still extremely poor, that will meet some of these targets and have re either reduced uh, HIV AIDS, uh, for example, or improved maternal health, which has happened in a number of countries, or certainly improved girls' uh, primary education, the reality is that in every single conflict-affected or fragile state in the world, uh, not one of these eight targets will have been met by the end of 2015. And I think that graphically shows the link between uh, peace and development. However, we have a new dawn in 2015, and the global goals for sustainable development have been agreed. There are 17 global goals, and uh, I want to start off this segment of the speech with a little uh, uh, video, which my glamorous assistant is about to ensure with ICD technology comes on now in full Technicolor. It's the second one, the one further down. 
if the Wi-Fi works and the ICD technology works, go. We can be. We must be. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequalities. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how it will get done. The global goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere. With no one left behind. We, we will live in a world where nobody anywhere lives in extreme poverty. Where no one goes hungry. Where no one wakes in the morning asking if there will be food today. We will live in a world where no child has to die from diseases we know how to cure. And where proper health care is a lifelong right for us all. We will live in a world where everyone goes to school. And education gives us the knowledge and skills for a fulfilling life. We will live in a world where all girls and all women have equal opportunities to thrive and be powerful and safe. We cannot succeed if half the world is headed back. We will live in a world where all people can get clean water and proper toilets at home, at school, and at work. We will live in a world where there is sustainable energy for everyone, heat, light, and power for the whole planet without destroying the planet. We will live in a world where economies prosper. A new wealth leads to decent jobs for everyone. And we will live in a world where our industry our infrastructure and our best innovations are not just used to make money, but to all make all our lives, lives better. We will live in a world where prejudices and extremes of inequality are defeated. Inside our countries and between different countries. Where people live in cities and communities that are safe and progressive and support everyone who lives there. Where we replace what we consume. Planet where we put back what we take out of the earth. We live in a world that is decisively rolling back the from climate, climate change. change. Where we restore and protect the, the life, life in, in our, our oceans, oceans and seas. <laughs> we'll restore and protect life on land. The forests, animals, the earth itself. With peace between and inside countries. Where all governments are open. And answer to us for what they do at home and abroad. And the justice rules. With everyone equal before the law. We're all countries and we their people. Work together in partnerships of all kinds to make these local goals, goals a reality for everyone, everywhere. These are the United Nations Global Goals for Sustainable Development. Let's, Let's get, get to work. work. Let's make it happen. Here we go, number eight. And the next one is, here we go. So 17 goals, and some people have said that these goals are too ambitious, there are too many, uh, and that uh, uh, not enough prioritization took place. But these goals have been the result of an incredible process. And uh, that process began, as was already mentioned this afternoon, uh, by looking at the, the deficiencies, the problems with the Millennium Development Goals uh, and setting out to have a clear policy, in this case, of inclusion, of transparency, and most importantly of all, universality, so that the goals applied across the world. They were not just about the Global North giving money to the Global South to reduce the most extreme forms of poverty, but they were about the whole world coming together in order to improve the lives of people who were in the worst conditions uh, in, in countries right across uh, the world. The, uh, keep going. We're stuck, I think, here with that. Um, yeah, next one. Here we go. Yeah, and as, as was already mentioned, the Rio summit uh, kicked off a process of global consultation at times involving hundreds of thousands of people in global uh, surveys uh, to ask them what were their priorities for these new uh, global goals. Draft after draft of agreement discussed throughout the continents and regions uh, of the world coming together this year in three key summits, one of which just finished yesterday uh, in Paris. First of all, in Addis Ababa in, in Ethiopia back in July, where a new financing partnership uh, was agreed 
imperfect, but a big step forward from what was there before with financial commitments from the richer world, but also a commitment of financial responsibility, commitments to taxation systems, to revenue generation, uh, and to business development uh, from across the developing world uh, as well. Then in New York in September, where uh, I had the privilege to be there as this was, uh, this was agreed, and you saw Malala there, the uh, Education for Girls activist uh, on the film. She spoke uh, at the General Assembly in New York and as the diplomats rather ignorantly continued to chatter on the floor of the General Assembly as she spoke from the gallery, she stopped them and said, uh, I think you should be listening because this is important for my generation. And they all, they all went silent uh, and listened to what she had to say. It was a very, uh, a very emotional moment. But at the General Assembly agreed unanimously these 17 goals and all of the targets that go with them. Uh, and then this, just this weekend, the third in the series of summits, agreeing the new climate change uh, uh, targets yesterday in Paris, uh, which hopefully uh, will give us a chance at long last to, to tackle and potentially in the longer term, maybe reverse climate change. Why are the SDGs so different? Well, apart from that process of global consultation and partnership, apart, there are, uh, I think, some very key differences from the MDGs. One is an absolute focus on gender equality, a recognition not only that uh, girls and women across the world deserve the right, same rights and the same access to services and prosperity uh, as, as, as boys and men, but also that women in many, many cases right across the world, women are the key drivers for development, both in communities but in uh, representative positions as well, and that has not been sufficiently recognised in the past. Uh, secondly, and one and particularly close to my heart, uh, in fact, I carry it around with me on my, uh, on my mobile phone, Goal 16, uh, Peace and Justice. Uh, uh, Goal 16 tries to address that fundamental uh, challenge that I said that with every single conflict or fragile affected state in the world meeting none of the MDGs by 2015, Goal 16 commits uh, us not just to education, to health, to clean water, uh, and, and all of the other important targets that are laid out, but says that the means to do that is through peace and justice and strong, stable institutions that people can trust inside their countries. And it has been a struggle to get that agreed. There are many countries in the world who do not want the United Nations as setting out these kind of targets, strong institutions, uh, uh, the rights of access to them for, for the people. But it was agreed eventually that this would be included uh, in these new global goals, and I think it's a major step forward. And interestingly, uh, big debate about the role of the private sector, but at least an understanding that uh, in terms of economic growth, uh, creating a proper business environment, creating the opportunity for investment uh, and for people to secure uh, employment uh, is as important. That, that opportunity to work, to earn a living, is as important uh, as the education, health, water uh, and so on that dominated the MDGs. And then this weekend we have Paris, and I thought a little video on that might be, uh, might be appropriate too. Some great pictures in this video. Famous people in the last one, great pictures in this one. Home. It means such completely different things to every person in the world. It's a house. It's a city, it's a country. Home is something you want to protect. People will go to extraordinary lengths to preserve their home. People love their homes. And if they don't feel that they have a home, they'll risk everything to find one. The further we find ourselves from home, the more we miss it. It's a question of perspective, of distance. And pretty much every single person who's been to space over the last 50 years has come to the same conclusion. It's the whole planet that's our home. The Earth was small, light, blue, and so touchingly alone. Our home that must be defended like a holy relic. When you're finally up at the moon, 
Looking back on Earth, all those differences and nationalistic traits are pretty well going to blend. And you're going to get a concept that maybe this is one world. And why the hell can't we learn to live together like decent people? On the first day up in space, we all pointed to our own countries. The third or fourth day, we were pointing to our continents. By the fifth day, we were aware of only one Earth. We have this connection to Earth. I mean, it's our home. Wherever we live, whatever language we speak or food we eat, the Earth is our home. We have to take care of it. And we should look out for everyone else who lives here. That has got to be our goal. That's why we need the goals. So I just want to conclude with, uh, with a few comments on the importance of, uh, uh, of these goals. The, here we go, and on to the next one, yeah. I think there are, there, there are really, um, in my view, uh, three key things I wanted to leave you with uh, today in relation to the goals, apart from that very important message of tell everyone, because the way to make this happen is that it, as many people in the world, right across the world, know about the goals and are therefore able to hold their governments and the international institutions to account uh, for the delivery of them. But I think there are three, three important uh, uh, elements. First of all, universality. Uh, these goals are not just about the rich countries helping the poorer countries of the world to improve basic education, uh, health, water, as was the case with the MDGs. Uh, they are about ensuring that those who are marginalised and excluded, wherever they live in the world, have an opportunity uh, to meet these targets. Uh, and, uh, and that will apply in countries inside the European Union as much as, it, well, maybe not as much, but in principle as much uh, as it applies in Southeast Asia or in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or uh, on the smallest island community in the Pacific. And these... Uh, and therefore, the universality of these goals means that they touch every single one of us and the people that live in our communities and in our, and, and in our countries. The second though, point, I think, though, is that the, um, this business of a new global partnership is key. This is no longer a case of a group of diplomats uh, from all countries, not just from the rich countries, but from all countries, meeting in isolation in New York and then telling everybody what they have decided. This is a new process that involve people and will, I think, be significantly more meaningful as a result. Because not just civil society that Stefan was just talking about, but people, particularly young people around the world, have been involved in this and they will remember it. And hopefully by 2030, we'll have seen much, much more progress than we've seen before. And I think as we move forward into these big meetings next year, a humanitarian summit in May in, in Istanbul, uh, a high-level political forum in July that will start to the business of annually looking at the progress towards Agenda 2030, uh, going back to this key document, which is available on the internet, Transforming Our World, the outcome document agreed and unanimously by the UN back in September. That combination of a responsibility amongst those who have the most in the rich world and a commitment on the part of those who govern in the poorer parts of the world to work together and to work in their own countries uh, to make the sort of difference that, we, that, that we, we want to see. I think that combination is a much, much more powerful combination than the old relationship of donor, donor and recipient that underpinned the MDGs back in 2000. So I think this is a fantastic opportunity. It's not going to be perfect. Uh, it's not going to be easy. Uh, and I've no doubt that by 2030 it will not be entirely fulfilled. But I think there is an incredible opportunity over the next 15 years to really transform the world in which we live in. I think these are goals are comprehensive, they are strategic, they make all the right links between all the different elements of development 
uh, and, and prosperity. Uh, and I hope that uh, we're going to have an opportunity over these years to see the sort of progress that they demand. Thank you. Yes, I think it generated many questions and comments, uh, but I would like uh, everybody to be short and precise uh, in the questions that you may have. Okay, here we come from the right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do we have a microphone for the gentleman here? <coughs> on the way. Here it comes. Uh, thank you very much for your comment. My name is Trivanos so Malao from Kenya. Yes. I'm also involved in civil society movements and activities. These calls are very good and are realistic, but they may not be achievable because of some reasons here and another. Some of the reasons which I would like to make observation about that it can be an obstacle for them to be achieved. One, most of the issues are discussed at a high level and they have never been trickled on the ground. How much is it being done or how much has been done to ensure that these issues have been trickled up to the grassroots? Because people at the grassroots they hardly know, even up to today, a number of people at the grassroots level, they don't know anything to do with this uh, calls, sustainable, 50, 17 sustainable development calls. They don't know about it. Two, there is also an aspect of dictatorship. Sometimes people are controlled. They don't have, they have never been given an opportunity to think on their own, their way, how they can implement what can be beneficial to them. Instead, they have been dictated how to think and they are guided directly how to think. So it makes them to stop thinking and working the way they are supposed to, be, to work. How do you handle such a kind of situations? Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, I think uh, on one of the things I learned um, very early on uh, uh, in, uh, in national politics was that unless there was a real argument about something, it was very hard to, uh, to have that issue uh, register with people. Unless there was a, a major row, uh, then uh, it was sometimes very hard to have the, to, to, for the general public, for the voters, to, uh, to, ha to have seen uh, and understood what was going on. And I think, so I think part of the problem that we, uh, we, we now have with these goals is there was so much consultation in advance and there was so much agreement when it came to September that it was not controversial. And people will probably remember the rows and arguments over the last few days on climate change from this year more than they will remember these 17 goals from September. And I think that gives each and every one of us a real uh, responsibility. Um, there are many, many uh, uh, tools available to publicize these goals. And these two videos that I've shown today come from a website called The Global Goals. Um, these videos, the website, all sorts of other materials are available. They are, in certain countries around the world, they are being shown in uh, schools. Um, some uh, religions have, have, uh, have also been encouraging the showing of, uh, of these videos and, and using some of the materials. Um, and so on and so forth. Uh, some, parliament, some parliamentarians have done the same thing. So and I think each of us in our networks uh, have some responsibility to try and publicise these goals because I think it's only by maximising the publicity and the understanding of the goals that we deal with your second point. 
because if uh, the leadership in any particular country, and this could be in a rich country or it could be in a poor country, uh, if the leadership in a country does not want to be held accountable for delivering these uh, goals, the best way to deal with that is to publicise them amongst uh, the citizens of that country and to educate them in the fact that the goals exist and that they were agreed by every one of those countries um, at the United Nations. So I completely take your uh, second point about the fact that there will be some leaderships who will want to keep their people in the dark. But I think uh, it is by responding to the first challenge of publicising these goals that we can, best, uh, we can best deal with that. And recognising that over 15 years, it will take some time in some countries to build up the capacity to deliver some of these goals. But we have to start that process now. Uh, let me take two questions together, one from this side and one from the middle. Yes? Yeah. Hi, my name is Shenandoah Cornish. Um, I hope this is okay with everybody. I'd actually like to ask a question about something you mentioned from the panel, if that's oh. all right with you. Okay. Um, the SDGs are very important to me, but I was really curious about something you said, um, which was that a lot of the conflicts today are less to do with territorial mm -hmm. expansion and more to do with like the clash of yep. identities, cultural identities. Um, just like a two sentence background. I'm a student at Washington and Lee University and I've spent the last like three and a half years fighting for permission to like set up my own course of study that's called cultural identity and ethno-nationalism. So like obviously this is something I'm really interested in. Um, my question for you is twofold. First of all, I was wondering what you think is the role of cultural identity in handling these ethno-nationalistic groups. And then secondly, with the increase in number of these groups that are um, vocalizing their position, what you think their impact on the international community is and how we should handle them. <laughs> okay. uh, We've we got a whole conference on that, I think. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. One more question here. Yes, and I'll just mention my colleagues have also just brought fresh coffee. In case you guys want to grab a cup of coffee and bring it to your place, feel free to do that as we're doing questions. Uh, we won't have an official coffee break around this time, so I just mentioned in case you need caffeine or whatever, it's just been replenished. But let's continue this final question. Sir, sir do you consider a kind of a prioritization of these goals? Or do you see all of them can go together at once? Great question. Uh, so let me deal with that first before I come back to the issue of, uh, of, of conflict. Um, my understanding of the process that's going to be followed here is that each individual country will be responsible for drawing up their national plan to implement the goals. Um, and that there is an expectation that every country will have a national plan. Um, so that will be the first point in the accountability that, that I was just talking about. And within that national plan, every country in the world will have to decide its own priorities. So that's where the priorities come in. So while you have um, uh, the, the universal goals, uh, some countries will need to tackle um, different goals with a much higher priority than others. So let me give an example. Um, in the Philippines, for the, for, which but I've, I've been working a lot this year, um, because they have more uh, typhoons and extreme weather events than any other country in the world, then uh, there is a specific goal that relates to resilience uh, from extreme weather events. And they will need to be tackling that if they're going to sustain improvements in education and the economy and health and water and so on. Um, and so every individual country should know the best priorities for them. And in, inside each country, uh, the population, civil society, parliamentarians and others should be able to comment on that national plan and give, it a, and give a chance to, to, to express a preference on their priorities. So that's how, that should, that's how it should work in practice, not necessarily work everywhere. And the priorities will be different in different kinds of countries. I know, for example, that the Obama administration in the United States is talking about the universality of the goals um, as a new opportunity to try and tackle this issue of the disillusionment, the disengagement of certain uh, uh, largely black communities from the police in certain big American cities. And trying to say, they, you know, how, do we, how do we improve this 
relationship? How do we improve the social standing of these communities so that they feel more empowered and, and more part of society? And that, that's obviously a different kind of challenge from the challenge of providing um, uh, basic education, agriculture, clean water and so on in parts of rural sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, every country will be different. Um, uh, I want to also use the Philippines as an example for your, your answer as well. I'll try and just say something very brief. Um, I mean, I, I do absolutely believe what I said earlier, that, that uh, essentially um, modern-day conflict is about, uh, if I can put it very simply, it's about territorial cleavages rather than territorial um, uh, growth. So it's no longer about expanding outside your country to try and take over other countries to become more rich and more powerful. It is now about inside countries, a real um, uh, conflict breaking out between different um, either nationalities or historical nationalities or religions or, or some other form of, of, of ethnic identity. And uh, in many cases, the, the, these... Uh, these disputes, these potential conflicts, these disagreements will have been suppressed for a very long time. In many cases, they will be inside countries where the borders were drawn by somebody else. Nigeria is a very good example of that. You're somebody here from Nigeria. Now, the Nigerian border was not drawn by Nigerians. It had no historical relevance, really. It was drawn by the British um, in order to create a huge colony that brought together all the different uh, ethnic identities of that area. And there are many, many other examples of that around the world. And, uh, um, and therefore, a lot of these uh, internal conflicts have been a long time coming. And um, I think we need a much smarter way of trying to resolve, uh, help resolve these conflicts. First of all, you can't resolve them from New York and Brussels. Uh, you know, people in Western Europe and North America cannot resolve a conflict about ethnic identity in, uh, um, you know, in, in either in a country in the, in the Arab world or in sub-Saharan Africa or uh, Southeast Asia or, or whatever else. So uh, the, the solutions to these conflicts will lie in the, in the country themselves, in the region, amongst the neighbours, where people understand the ethnicities and the, and the tensions. And what we need to do is support these regions in, in helping to solve the conflicts in their own areas, rather than try and do it from a distance. And I think that's been a big mistake in policy over recent times. Um, but secondly, I think we also need to be very clear that unless people find a political expression for their identity and their region, then the, the, the peace will not be sustainable. And I'll give a very precise example of that. And I'm working in the Philippines at the moment. They have a peace agreement in Muslim Mindanao, in the big southern island in the Philippines, which will give significant uh, autonomy, autonomous government, uh, to elected, an elected government in that region. And that is the only way to resolve this uh, long-standing conflict. The people who live in that region, the people who feel aggrieved at the way they've been treated for 50 years by the centre, um, they want to be empowered to develop their area and to have, you know, and have a voice in their area. And this is true in so many other countries in the world. The problem in the Philippines is that the majority have been uh, frightened for, for those 40 years by what they've been told about the Muslims who live in Mindanao. Um, so the elected politicians in Manila have to play to that majority so you have, a, you have a disconnect between the majority and the minority. But unless around the world the majorities understand that the minorities need a political expression, an autonomous government within the state, then I don't think most of these conflicts will be resolved. And I think we, can, we could list 20 examples here today of conflicts in the world where that's the situation. So I think autonomous regional government inside states is critical. And I think a greater cultural understanding is important. And I think a regional-based solution cooperation and not trying to impose solutions from New York or Brussels, I think is the long-term way ahead. Thank you very much, uh, although there are many other questions, but uh, we'll take one more question for oh, Redmond. Okay. Hi, sir. I actually asked uh, Sir Mark for this because I actually am from the Philippines. I thought you might be. I heard your voice earlier. I yeah. Uh, I'm working actually for the Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, so it's okay. really interesting for me to hear you talk about okay. it. My simple question is, with all what's happening right now in Mindanao, 
uh, I think you've heard of you've heard of uh, the what happened in Mama Sapano, yes. which actually greatly affected the negotiations that's yep. actually happening. From your efforts, the efforts. Thank you, by the way, for the efforts that you're doing. I never heard of it, but right now it's it's very good that someone's actually helping us. But anyways, uh, from the efforts and from the things that you're doing right now, how do you see the process going to be? Like, let's say in the next few months, for an instance. Right now, they're saying that uh, the Senate will pass the Bangsamoro Basic Law, but a lot of people are doubting it because of the politics in the Philippines. But in your perspective, as someone from the outside working to do something in the Philippines, in that particular region, how do you see the possibility of it being successful? Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I would say is that for those of you who are not aware of the situation in the Philippines, if you are studying international relations and conflict uh, or diplomacy, then it is a good, a good uh, peace process at the moment that would be worth studying. And uh, there's plenty of material on the internet. The Office of the Presidential Advisor on the Peace Process in the Philippines uh, runs a great website, lots of information, always on Twitter. Um, you, can, uh, you can follow this uh, because I think it could be very significant. Um, I think the peace process in the Philippines and the Bang Samoro area is important for two reasons. Um, the first is that it is an, a, a really good example of how conflict affects development. Um, in, in, in Muslim Mindanao, in the, in the, in the, in the territory that you, you work in, um, the, the chances of a girl finishing primary school are 23%. 23%. Even in the poorest parts of the rest of the Philippines, it's 75%. So a, a, a ratio of three to one in the conflict affected area. Um, and uh, uh, a child is three times more likely to die before the age of five in Muslim Mindanao than they are in the rest of the, of the, rest of the Philippines. So that is a, a measure of how peace and development go hand in hand. Um, I think the... Uh, I think the conflict there is really interesting because it might also provide an example to elsewhere in the world. Um, what, what we basically have in Muslim Mindanao is a long-standing um, violent group, the MILF, uh, who have decided to choose the path of peace and democracy. They have, well, they want to turn themselves into a political party. They have agreed to the creation of an autonomous regional government, and they are uh, committee to standing in elections and went, trying to win the support of the people rather than, rather than continuing the campaign of violence. And unlike almost every other armed group that I have come across in the world, they have given up weapons publicly in daylight in front of the television cameras and some of their combatants have walked the line and gone back into the community publicly in daylight in front of the television cameras. That never happened in Northern Ireland, in the UK. It certainly didn't happen in the Basque region that uh, Zapatero was talking about the other night. Um, so I think this is a really powerful example of a group, an Islamic group, choosing the path of peace. And if they can be supported in achieving this, that could be a great example elsewhere in the world uh, at, at the moment. Um, so I think that's important. And uh, there was something else I was going to say that I've completely... You, you, you asked about... There was something else here. Well, you mentioned the Mama Sopano incident. That was the other thing I was going to say. I, I, think it, I think it is going to be successful. It may take some time, but I think it is going to be successful. Um, it also shows the critical importance of leadership. Um, in 1998, when, when Tony Blair and the British government signed the Northern Irish Peace Agreement uh, on Good Friday and East, at Easter, four months later, uh, one of the worst bombings of the whole conflict in Northern Ireland took place in a market town uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, well over 100 people were killed, uh, some very young children and babies, um, in a bomb that was let off in a, in, a, in, a, in a Saturday market. And there were calls at that time to tear up the agreement and to stop the agreement. And it was the leadership of the British government at that time and the others involved that said, no, we're going to go on the path to peace, we're going to implement this agreement and we're not going to let one incident by rogues deter us from this. And as a result of that, if you think about it, 1998 to 2005, 
every single young person leaving high school in Northern Ireland today, this year, has lived their whole life in peace. Whole life in peace. Um, and I think the same has to be true in the Banks of Moro area of the Philippines. That although there was that one violent incident back in January, um, a number of unfor unfortunate circumstances and 47 people died. Um, I think it needs leadership now to say that the path of peace has been chosen. And even if there are going to be bad incidents along the way, then the leadership must stick with that path. Because in 20 years' time, the children born in the, uh, who born to, born this year will appreciate the fact that they've lived all their lives in peace. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, very, very entertaining uh, speech. Please Thank join you. me thanking Lord McCann for, for his uh, pleasure.